I'm about to meet someone very special. This way. Shh. Come on. Hey, sis. Hey, brother. What's up? How are you? I'm good. Who's this gorgeous girl? Renija. Renija. Yeah. Could I hold her? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Hey. <sighs> Beautiful face. Hmm? This is baby Renesia. The possibilities for Renesia seem endless. But along the way, she'll encounter hurdles that are greater for her purely because of the color of her skin. She's already overcome her first hurdle by being here alive, happy, and healthy. But there's more to come. So how far could Renesia go? Could she one day become our country's leader? To sit in our highest office? To be our prime minister? How much harder would it be for Renesia than for the baby born in the next room to white parents? That's what we're gonna find out. Australia prides itself on being a diverse, multicultural nation. Is this really the land of the fair go? My name's Mark Colesmith. I'm an actor, musician, and proud Nyingana man. And I'm going on a journey to discover what it would take to get an Indigenous Australian into this country's highest office. The road to the top job is a tough one. To better understand what it takes, we're going to take a look at the lives of Australia's former leaders and analyse how they got there. Someone who's been to private schools, someone who's potentially a Rhodes Scholar. That's the sort of person we're talking about. We'll expose the barriers Indigenous people face in the battle for better representation and opportunities. An 18-year-old Indigenous man is more likely to go to prison than to attend university. Then we're going to crunch the numbers and discover the exact probability we have of electing our first black PM. The chances of an Indigenous child born today becoming Prime Minister is about... Wow. We absolutely have somebody in our community who is capable of doing this. And we'll meet inspirational Australians who are working to close the gap and make this dream a reality. I was elected the first female Prime Minister in the National Indigenous Youth Parliament. It was just pretty much this kind of week of just becoming leaders. Oh man, I've never felt so connected, you know? So what chance does an Indigenous kid today have of one day leading the nation? With an election looming, we'd like to know, will Australia ever have a black PM? journey, I'm travelling to Australia's northwest, to a place that is very special to me. I'm just outside Broome where I grew up. The traditional owners here are the Yaru people, and they've lived here for tens of thousands of years, or in their own words, since the Bulgara Gara. I've started here because this beautiful tourist town has flourished, despite having a dark past. In the 1880s, the British established a settlement here. They were only interested in chasing pearls. That industry was built on the backs of indigenous slaves and later indentured workers from Asia. But despite its difficult beginnings, or maybe because of them, it became an amazing place to grow up. A diverse community where people get on no matter their race or religion. So if this town has been able to progress so far, maybe Australian politics can too. But when my friends and I were growing up here, politics and prime ministers were the last things on our minds. Most people were just getting by, 
dealing with everyday issues. We certainly didn't think we would become prime ministers. We didn't have those role models. But I'm hoping that'll change. I've come back to my old school to find out if the next generation of Aboriginal broom kids have more interest in becoming prime minister than I had. Hey, kids, what now? Hi. How are you? Hi. Is good? Hi. My name is Mark, and it's my old school, and I've come back to start an adventure. I'm going to ask the question when Australia will have its first Indigenous prime minister. Why do you think we haven't had one yet? Um, because some of the, um, the Australian, they don't really trust us that much. Do you think, do you think black people, they know some stuff that other people don't know, that they could, they could give something to that role that's special? Maybe language. Language. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Language. Bush medicine. Bush medicine. Look after the land. And that's a very important one. What other difficulties would an Indigenous Prime Minister face? They'd have to live in Canberra. Um, you'd have to be really far from your friends and family. Like, normally your friends or family help you out. Um, I think they would have to have a really good education. They would have to have a lot of money. Hands up, who thinks they could be an Indigenous PM? Ooh, slow hands, slow hands. Yeah, you think you could do it? Yeah. How hard do you think it would be? Um, pretty Very hard, hard and yeah. scary. Very hard and scary. Because, like... We have to get votes and most people vote for the white people because they apparently claim this land and all that. All right, I'm going to head off and find out what I can. I'll catch you later. Yeah. 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 It's been great talking to these kids. They're definitely more switched on to the world outside Broome than I was at their age. But even now, they're not confident they'll see a black PM anytime soon. And when we look back at the leaders we've had, Maybe they have a point. Australians have had 30 Prime Ministers since Federation, and it's been a real mixed bag. Menzies was our longest-serving Prime Minister. He held the job for two terms, 18 years all up, while Frank Ford was in office for just eight days. No-one remembers poor Frank. We've had those who have been educated in our finest universities and others who didn't even make it to high school. There are lawyers and highfalutin finance types but we've also had a greengrocer, a train driver and a couple of coal miners. It's a broad field, but what you can say is that all of our 30 previous and current Prime Ministers, the only attribute that is absolutely consistent with all of them, they're all white. So what do the lives of our last 30 PMs tell us about who our future PM might be? And what are the obstacles in the way of that person being Indigenous. Yin Paradis is a professor of race relations and Indigenous knowledges at Deakin University in Melbourne. He's going to crunch the numbers and tell us what chance an Indigenous kid born today has of making it into our highest office. So, Mark, in Australia we've had 30 Prime Ministers since Federation, but for this exercise we're focusing on the 16 Prime Ministers that have served since World War II because their life experiences are much more similar to ours. Sure. The road to becoming a Prime Minister will be difficult for an Indigenous person uh, for a number of reasons. First of all, let's talk about income. We know in Australia today the median household income for Indigenous people is 36% less than for other Australians. So that's $542 a week compared to $852 for non-Indigenous Australians. Well, having less money will definitely make it harder. But it's not just money, it's housing. So Indigenous people are seven times, seven times more likely to live in social housing than non-Indigenous Australians. That's a huge number. Education is another major factor. Every single Prime Minister after World War II, except for Paul Keating, had a tertiary education. Today, the reality is that an 18-year-old Indigenous man is more likely to go to prison than to attend university. Wow. So we're, we're more likely to go to prison than Parliament? Yes, much more. 
And of course, the story of education starts much earlier than university. It goes all the way back to foundations, uh, which in Australia is kindergarten. We know that only 68% of Indigenous kids attend early education for more than 15 hours a week, compared to 78% of non-Indigenous children. So right from the start, we're falling behind. Yeah, they're missing out on important opportunities, and that will make it difficult on this pathway to becoming Prime Minister. Early childhood learning plays a vital role in setting kids up for their school life, both academically and socially. In Perth, the Murich Noongar Community College has excellent attendance rates for Indigenous four- and five-year-olds. I've come here to see how they do it. Hello, kids. Meet Mr Mark, because he's going to join us today. Say welcome. Say wanju, Mr Mark. Where should I sit? I'm, I'm, I'm going to sit here. And hopefully you're going to join in and learn some Noongar words too? Hope so. Kaya, I do the Noongar language here. And that can be taught through everything. Say Karang. 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 Everyone say it. Karang. You know, you're doing science, you're doing everything. Barna, balap kidlak talyako. Barna, balap kidlak talyako. They learn more through song. So you can interpret any song and, and change it over to Noongar language. Nona, jurup nona kadich barmin ma. Nona, jurup nona kadich barmin ma. Nona, jurup nona. And before it was said it was wrong, everything was wrong that, that was in Noongar or Aboriginal, you're all wrong. You've got to be something that you're not, and you can't be. So this allows you to be who you are and to embrace everything else that's around you. This is wild. I, I'm too scared to even make this bigger. This is, this is stressing me out. This is so tall, I can't even look. I can't even watch. This is too much. Oh, 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 it's the last piece. No, it isn't. Is it? Oh, this is the last piece. Where should, where, oh, is it? Oh, there's even more. Oh, I can't do I can't watch. I can't be a part of this. Oh! <laughs> Two-way learning, you know? The culture, the Aboriginal culture, the culture of this land, the peoples that were here before, needs to be intertwined with the education of today, you know, because we've got to go forward together. But we can't forget who we are as Indigenous people we had a past, and our children need to know where they came from. Things have been suppressed so long, when they start learning about where they came from and the values within their culture, you've become whole again. You know, you're whole. Embracing Noongar culture is a fundamental part of improving attendance here. But there is another key element. Oh, look here. Hello. How are you? So they need to be welcome. So you make them feel safe. And sometimes there, there could be some little fellows that think, well, you know, yippee, I'm going to school now because I know that everything's good there. I know that everything's right. Do you think Indigenous students get that same experience in mainstream schools? Sometimes it could be difficult. You know, there's racism out there. That's why it's good to have education workers within the schools to help make that child that's out of it feel comfortable. Paper, scissors, rock. Oh, you won. <laughs> Do you think one of these kids could one day become our first Indigenous PM? Well, I've seen a few that I reckon might be. Oh, really? Yeah, yes. We've got a couple here. Yeah, just going from here and setting that goal that they want to make a difference, you know? Yeah. Every day we can make a difference. That's right. But I hope to, I live to see that day, boy. <laughs> Murich demonstrates that an educational approach that embraces and teaches Aboriginal culture enhances Indigenous kids' chances of success, perhaps even putting them on the path to Canberra. But to become PM will mean eventually attending mainstream educational institutions and the increased risk of being subject to discrimination.
back in Melbourne, Yin has some shocking stats that illustrate how this could play out in an Indigenous kid's quest to become Prime Minister. The difference is quite alarming in how well kids are doing at school. So we know that by age 15, Indigenous students are on average two and a third years behind in their literacy and numeracy outcomes. So they're operating at a year eight level in year 10. That's massive. How's that gonna make you feel as a young person in that school system if you know that you're that far behind? Yeah, it's gonna have massive impacts on your self-esteem, your inspiration to f even finish school. So we know that only 65% of Indigenous students actually go on to finish Year 12. For the rest of students in Australia, that's 89%, much higher. That looks like this system is teaching young Indigenous students to fail. The system is definitely failing Indigenous students. And it's not even just about graduating. Where you go to school is, is really important too. We know that the majority of our post-war Prime Ministers have attended private schools in Australia. But for Indigenous students, that's very rare to be able to, to afford. Yeah, none of this looks like the pathway to an Indigenous Prime Minister. No, it's, it's looking like a very difficult road to be travelling along. But at this prestigious private school, Geelong Grammar, one man is reversing the trend. Waverley Stanley has created a scholarship system for Indigenous students at this exclusive school. For Waverley, this approach is tried and proven. When he was 12, he was invited to attend a private school, Toowoomba Grammar, an experience that changed his life for the better. I was the first Aboriginal boy at Toowoomba Grammar School from 1980 to 84 to finish school. I had a great experience there. And I suppose that was the genesis. My experience at Toowoomba Grammar School was what I wanted for other Indigenous children. I always wondered why there wasn't other Indigenous children at Toowoomba Grammar School with me. And, um, and then there was something that, it was a burning ambition and a, and a desire for me that if, uh, if I got into a position, I'd like to give other Indigenous children the same opportunity that I had. Kids that can afford to come to Geelong Grammar have access to top quality academic, sports, arts, and extracurricular programs. Waverley's organization, Yallery, invites promising indigenous youth to study here and at a number of other campuses. How many students do you have here currently? At Geelong, we've got 23 children here, 21 at Kariah campus, and two up at Timbertop, up at Mansfield. Then. Wow, and they're from across the country? All across Australia, yeah, and then you know, both a lot from the Northern Territory and then um, Victoria. And how are the students selected? They apply to us on a scholarship and then, and then uh, my staff and others, we will go around and interview all the children all around Australia in their homes. And then they come down and have an interview at the school with the principal or the deputy principal. Could schools like this hold the key to getting more of our Indigenous youth into positions of power and influence? Our children deserve to be at these schools. They take their rightful place at these schools because of, of just who they are. This education, they, they, they can take it with both hands and run as hard as and as fast as they can and change this country, change this world, because we need leaders that are going to change. But they never lose their Indigenous heritage, they never lose their, their, their value system, they never lose their, uh, their honour in regards to what they are as, as Indigenous people. They think we went on Google, but yeah. we're not using Guys, it. Guys, where's everyone going for Christmas? Oh. Home. Um, we had like a bet who screamed first, and she screamed. I was no, like, I didn't. Screamed. I was like, woo! I was having fun. <laughs> she was the one Amongst the 23 Indigenous students at Geelong Grammar is Talia, a Year 10 student. It's made me see how big, like, the rest of the world is. There's so, there's so much more out there, so much more that I could do, so much more other people can do, so many differences that you could make. What's been some of the difficult things about being here? All right, so one of the biggest things for me was homesickness. It was very hard, and especially just, I'm very close with my family, so it was difficult not to talk to them. And also it was difficult missing out on my little siblings growing up. What's the thing that makes you proud about being black? It is the oldest living culture in the world. I love that. And also just connects you to so many different people. I have, you could have family everywhere and anywhere. 
and it makes me very proud to think there's so many of us. So we've survived this long. And despite how many people have tried to get rid of us, we're still here. And what can we expect of Talia in the future for Australia? Well, I really love reading and I'm really good at English. So I'm thinking a publisher or an author, maybe a journalist at a stretch. The education these kids are getting is amazing. It's an impressive school. And it gives these kids opportunities they could have never imagined at a time when education and support is most vital. We know from Yin's stats that education plays a pivotal role in the journey to becoming Prime Minister. And most of us rely on the government for educational funding. So how much impact is government money earmarked for Aboriginal education and support making in our communities? To find out, I've come to the Northern Territory. This is the Gove Peninsula in northeast Arnhem Land. The traditional owners here are the Yolngu, and this is also where the fight for land rights first began. This place is rich in bauxite, and in the 60s, the government came in and started carving it up, issuing mining licenses without consulting the community. The Yolngu got together, and they signed a petition demanding the government acknowledge their ownership of the land. The Aborigines have opposed the development. They claim that their land rights have been unlawfully invaded, both by the Commonwealth Government and Nabalco. An injunction against the defendants started the first full-scale test case to establish Aboriginal land rights in Australia. The petition became the first traditional documents recognised by Commonwealth Parliament. And although they still issued those mining licences, it set a precedent for native title and forced the government to recognise Aboriginal land rights. Clearly, the region has natural wealth and investment. But just a kilometre away from the refinery in Ganyangara, there's no sign of that prosperity. Denise Bowden runs the Yothiyindi Foundation, a not-for-profit organisation working in these remote areas. She feels well-directed government funding is extremely important for these communities. How tough is the day-to-day -day in places like this? It's incredibly difficult. Um, um, not to say this community hasn't got a lot to give, but um, on a day-to-day -day basis, it, it, it is a struggle, absolutely. There's a lot of people that think places like this are swimming in government funds and that we should be dealing with these issues better. That's simply not true. We're living in impoverished states here. This is Australia, uh, and we're in third, fourth world conditions here in, in this region. Why aren't these communities receiving the funding they need? In 2017, the Yothu Yindi Foundation did an audit of GST payments the Northern Territory government had earmarked for Indigenous services. They found a massive shortfall between what was meant to go into these communities and what was actually spent. We lodged a submission with the Productivity Commission on to uh, GST spending across the Northern Territory and found $522 million worth of underspend, uh, which is a considerable amount of money. There's no um, legal obligation to uh, report for the Northern Territory Government how those funds are spent. We're actually not too sure where those funds end up. The Foundation was able to document a consistent funding shortfall year on year since the GST was first introduced. I don't say this easily, that there is a, an industry that's based uh, upon um, and preying upon Indigenous disadvantage here in the Northern Territory. There's been billions of dollars that have come into the Northern Territory government coffers that cannot be traced back on to local communities. We can't see it on the ground, so where are those funds going? The funding deficit has taken its toll on education in remote communities, where Indigenous teenagers can be three to four years behind non-Indigenous students, and attendance rates have been as low as 30%. Six years ago, the Yothu Yindi Foundation came up with a new approach and established a regional bush school to help re-engage kids who are most at risk of missing out on an education. 
The New Diploma Foundational Learning Centre tries to capture a cultural curriculum that is led by families. What it does is try to re-engage kids that are just not going to school at the moment. They're, they're lost. They've not got the basic numeracy and literacy skills to get them to uh, employment pathways. Uh, so we're trying to reinvigorate that in terms of learning on country um, and, and trying to have an, a, a different perspective on you know, education isn't necessarily um, taught in a classroom here. If this Dupama Foundation of Learning didn't exist, then there is nothing in this region. I was absolutely shocked and so disappointed that there's no accountability for that degree of money that was meant to come into these communities and meant to help improve our social outcomes for these places. What she's up to today? Looking for... Showing things. Fruits. Looking for fruits? Bush, bush fruit. Oh, that's good, because I'm, I'm a bit hungry at the moment. But I see the young kids up here speaking their language and, you know, connecting with country as part of a school program. And yeah, I think every single one of those kids has got a future, you know, because, you know, they got that support, they got people believing in them. So I leave the Northern Territory disappointed, and yet with hope for the future. I've seen how the path to becoming our first black prime minister can be challenging in early education, primary and secondary school. And now I'm keen to investigate higher education. The 2018 Closing the Gap report reveals that despite more indigenous students enrolling in tertiary education than ever before, our first year dropout rates are double those of non-Indigenous. But why is university so important for a future black prime minister? The answer can be found here, at the University of Sydney. If we look at it from a statistical point of view, our next prime minister is more likely to come from this university than any other. And they'll most likely have a degree in law, just like Barton, Menzies, McMahon, Whitlam, Howard and Turnbull. As it happens, I know someone who is on that very pathway here at this university. A new school. This is my youngest sister, Malika. From humble beginnings in Broome, she has managed to find a pathway into one of the most elite courses in Australia, a law degree here at the University of Sydney. She's perfectly positioned to give us an insight into the challenges Indigenous students face at institutions like this. Well, this is a pretty nice view. So, we've got a lot of Australia's Prime Ministers come out of this university. Do you think it's because of the education? I think so, but it also comes with a specific level of class and values. To come here, you have to have high grades, you have to have money. You know, there's a whole level of class attached to this university. How did you get to this uni and why are you here? So what I actually was able to achieve is a Commonwealth supported placement. Now that's not Indigenous specific, that's for any Australian that can show that they've got exceptional marks. So that means that my fees have dropped down from $105,000 for three years down to $35,000. So that's better than a scholarship for me. Malika and I were raised in the Kimberley. For her, and many other Indigenous students, getting through university in the city is a challenge. The hardest thing would be the lack of support in regards to I'm 5,000 kilometres away from home. I don't have a family that can pay for my rental accommodation, so I have to work. But accommodation and living expenses are not the only issues. Malika's own identity has been challenged here. I actually had one comment in a class where I was talking about our upbringing. And when I started talking to people about, you know, the difference like what you see in the media versus the reality of those conditions. And then somebody actually came up to me afterwards and was like, why do you feel like you can talk about that? You're not Aboriginal? Or aren't you like 116th? And it was this really challenging thing because then I realised they're looking for a stereotypical Aboriginal. And I wasn't fitting that box for them. But are there also lecturers and professors that are really supportive and are understanding here? 
Definitely. I find a lot of teachers are really supportive towards me. They get really excited that there's an Aboriginal female in their class for the first time. We've had more Prime Ministers come out of this university than any other. Are you going to be our next? <laughs> I don't think that that's my direct aim. I think for me, I want to do a little bit of experience practicing litigation, focusing on children's court. I want to look at environmental law and energy law. I think after those different kinds of employment opportunities, you go into policy making, you make change there, and then you work your way into government. Despite the dropout rates and the odd misunderstanding, it's great to see Malika and other Indigenous students making a go of it in our top universities. But how far do these degrees get them? And is this new generation of highly educated Indigenous graduates translating into better access to some of Australia's senior professional roles? So, Mark, of the top corporations in Australia, the ASX 200, only eight of the 200 leaders of those corporations have a non-European background. So that's 4%. And none of those people leading those big companies are Indigenous. And these are positions that have quite a bit of power and influence, yeah? It's a lot of power, yeah, in the corporate world. If we look at the about 100 people who head up our government, those are the heads of departments, federal and state departments in Australia, one of those is non-European. And none of them are Indigenous. Wow. And do we think that's because there's underqualification? Well, actually, no. I think there are enough qualified Indigenous people. And, you know, government is a good employer of Indigenous people in general. But at the top of those spaces, Indigenous people are not there. What about universities? You know, leaders of our universities, uh, vice-chancellors, not a single one is Indigenous. Among politicians, only 1.5% of them are Indigenous. So it's, it's not just a matter of finishing school and graduating from university. You're then faced with the prospect of trying to be one of the first Indigenous representatives in any of these key political or corporate positions. There's none there. Exactly, yeah. Before we can hope to have a black prime minister, we need to see a lot more indigenous leadership in this country. But we've absolutely seen an increase in indigenous students at university in recent years. Attendance is as high as it's ever been. And that's giving us, over time, a group of educated uh, indigenous professionals out there. One of those Indigenous professionals has been reporting on Australia's changing society for the last 30 years and is optimistic about a future black PM, Stan Grant. Well, joining me now is Stan Grant. I'm Stan Grant and I'll be reporting live. How does he reconcile his success within our current culture with his Indigenous ancestry? The really simple answer to what being Aboriginal means is that it's my family. That's, the, you know, that's a really simple answer. But growing up as an Aboriginal kid in 1960s, 1970s Australia was really tough. There's no way to sugarcoat that. We were marginalised, fringe-dwelling outsiders. We were just extraordinarily poor. We were effectively homeless. My father and mother roamed around the country looking for work, we were constantly being uprooted, moving from town to town just to survive. There was always the threat of children being taken away. It had happened to my mother's younger brothers and sisters. But I also grew up aware that I came out of a community that was resilient and strong and amazingly supportive. But that resilience has been constantly challenged by the media. I don't think that the broader Australian media uh, is the reflection of Australian culture more broadly 
has any real understanding about who we are. We are a much more sophisticated, complex and nuanced community than the one-dimensional representation of the media would have most people believe. This whole doco is, uh, is about asking the question, will Australia ever have a black PM? What do you think? No, we won't have a black PM, but we will have a PM who's black. And I think that's a difference. The Aboriginal person who becomes Prime Minister, more likely to the rest of Australia, won't even necessarily be an Aboriginal person. They certainly won't look like something that the rest of Australia imagines an Aboriginal person to look like. They are going to be privileged someone who's been to private schools, someone who's potentially a Rhodes Scholar. That's the sort of person we'll be talking about. And for the rest of Australia, they'll look at that person and think, is that person really Aboriginal? That's the question they're going to get asked. How are you really Aboriginal? Because we already get asked that. Well, I get asked that all the time. I think the thing that I think about a lot is that space between the ship and the shore. I had ancestors on the ship, convict Irish ancestors, and I had ancestors standing on the shore. That space between the ship and the shore, that's where we create Australia. Who better to speak to that space than someone who is born from the oldest culture on this continent and a born of modern Australia as well? I think that's what the first Prime Minister who is Aboriginal will represent. That person will speak to all of us. It'll be a, it'll be a magnificent moment, eh? What struck me from Stan's interview was his optimism. He believes in Australian democracy, in the idea of Australian democracy, and in the idea of Indigenous engagement with Australian politics. Our future Black Prime Minister won't be forging an entirely new path. There have been some inspirational Aboriginal trailblazers who have succeeded in federal politics, despite the odds. Our first Indigenous parliamentarian was Neville Bonner. He was elected in 1971. Now, he was born in rural New South Wales. He had no formal education and worked as a cane cutter and a stockman before entering the public service. It would be another 28 years before we had a second senator, and then 11 years after that, we finally had the first Aboriginal member in the House of Representatives, Ken Wyatt. Then we got our first Indigenous winner of an Olympic gold medal, Nova Peris. Joanna Lingram followed, and then Pat Dodson, Linda Burney, and finally, Malandiri McCarthy. I've come to meet one of our current Indigenous parliamentarians here in Western Australia. I'm a couple of k's outside of Bunbury in WA South, and I'm on my way to Rowlands to meet Ken Wyatt, who was this country's first Indigenous Cabinet Minister. Rowlands is where Ken was born. At the time, his mother was interned here as part of the Stolen Generation. This place was a mission, run by churches and sanctioned by government. Between 1941 and 1975, hundreds of Indigenous children were separated from their families and sent to live here. Ken, hey, oh, how, how are you? Good, good to see you. Yeah, good to see you. Thank you for coming this way. You reckon you can give me the tour? Yeah, I will do. Yeah, solid. Roland's mission was closed in the 70s, but the grounds have been maintained and serve as a memorial and education centre for its past. Ken has some photos from that time. So this is a photograph of my grandfather and grandmother and other members of the family. So they were here in Rollins, my mother and grandmother. And at the back, grandfather sort of hidden behind the older ones. And both grandmother and grandfather weren't allowed here other than for when they were visiting. It's a great photo showing all of them together. Now, your mother was a little girl, and she was taken from her family. She was brought to this place under government policy. How do you reflect on that today? I think part of what you realise is we were fortunate we weren't in that period. My mother never talked about the negative things here. 
What she always talked about was the things they did, uh, the schooling they had. And it's interesting when I heard them talk about just the different experiences. There was no bitterness, which always intrigued me. But there was obviously a pain that was internal and the impact of being removed from their families because it broke the cultural connection. It broke the paternal protection and connection. It broke brother from sister, sister from brother, sister from sister. Displaying enormous resilience, Ken's mother never succumbed to the trauma of being a part of the stolen generation and became happily married with 10 children. Ken was the oldest. It doesn't sound like the kind of origin story most people would expect for a federal minister. I remember as a 10-year-old, skinny-ankled, little Aboriginal kid running around, somebody made a comment, you might end up being a politician one day, and I thought, not in this country will I ever have that opportunity. And so, look, going from a mission to being a minister has been an incredible journey, but it's a powerful one because it shows that we can do anything that there are no barriers to our people at all. And one day, we'll have an Indigenous Prime Minister. It's only a matter of when, but it will happen. When you first entered Parliament, you wore a kangaroo cloak? Yeah, it was. It was a booker. It's what Nyungas call it, booker. Mm. The apology to the stolen generation has been a powerful instrument in the healing of both our people and our nation. The apology was acknowledged and received in the spirit for which it was offered. When the former Prime Minister delivered the apology on the 13th of February 2008 in this chamber, I shed tears for my mother and her siblings. My mother and her siblings, along with many others, <coughs> did not live to hear the words delivered in the apology, which would have meant a great deal to them individually. <coughs> I felt a sense of relief that the pain of the past had been acknowledged and the healing could begin. What's it like to be standing there in that space in front of all of those people, speaking on behalf of the pain of so many other people? When I managed to get those words out, the relief, it was more around the fact that a part of our history had been acknowledged and that I had the incredible privilege of being able to say, I acknowledge the apology to our people. You've already achieved so much. What effect do you hope becoming our country's first Indigenous cabinet minister has for Indigenous people? If I had a legacy, that is the, the mark you leave for others to follow. So historically, culturally, we used to leave marks so we could follow pathways and know where the journey was. We'd know the song lines. I hope that my song line is the story of getting to a pinnacle point in this nation that allows others to follow and walk that same pathway. So do you think Australia is ready for an Indigenous PM yet? <laughs> Probably some sections aren't, but hey, that's tough luck. If we have somebody who comes up through the ranks, is elected to head a party, by their peers and they become Prime Minister, then that's the process we have in this superb democracy.
Amazing to meet you. You're um, 18, you've just graduated, and you've already rubbed shoulders with some of the most powerful men and women in the country. What was that like? Last year, and I was elected the first um, female prime minister of the National Indigenous Youth Parliament. And so that has kind of just been, you know, just incredible, you know, the whole experience. That's huge. I didn't <laughs> even know there was a National yeah. Indigenous Youth Parliament. Yeah. Can you tell me a bit about it? Sure. So pretty much the National Indigenous Youth Parliament was um, a kind of sitting of 50 uh, young Indigenous people aged between 15 and 25 who all came to Canberra from different territories and states. We had this amazing week where we passed mock bills, we elected leaders. It was just the most empowering thing. What kind of vision do you think you're starting to see or want to see for this country? The kind of area that my activism is based in really is just the education system. I go to a school in Melbourne's inner suburbs and you know, while it has incredible kind of, you know, facilities and teachers, Indigenous history is just not talked about at all. If we're not teaching Indigenous history, in our school curriculums, it actually doesn't give me a context in which to live, you know? I walk around the city and I walk around my school and I'm not reflected anywhere, you know? Um, nowhere. What always kind of homes back to me is my grandma. She was part of the Stolen Generation. She didn't get to go to school. She didn't get to learn her language. Her culture wasn't in any way kind of celebrated or even looked at. And so all my kind of activism is pretty much because she didn't get to do it, you know? And I feel like it's my kind of duty a little bit, you know? What can the rest of Australia learn about Indigenous Australia? Um, I guess it's just our inherent complexity. We have over 250 different tribes and clans and nations, you know? Each with their own religious edicts and language groups and ceremonies and traditions and cultures. While Indigenous leaders are incredible, what is so cool about them is that they all represent and think differently and have different ideas in terms of solutions for communities. And that's, it's that kind of complexity which is often denied. Your mother is Gumbangri? <laughs> And your yeah. father's of British ancestry? British, Scottish. Right. Yeah, yeah. How do you identify with that mix? It becomes a bridge, you know? I, I, I somehow fit between two groups of people that don't know a lot about each other and to an extent might not even like each other. So hopefully I can somehow bridge that and go, OK, so I know both these spaces, both these communities, what can I do as a literal representation of, of connecting these people? I just feel as though hopefully I can use it to my advantage eventually, you know? Aretha's story gives me hope. Her generation isn't about to give in, despite the odds. But what exactly are they up against? So, Yen, we're coming up to the end of this journey. What do these final numbers tell us about our chances of having a black PM? Well, Mark, as you know, we looked at the life journeys of our past prime ministers, uh, focusing in on those 16 post-World War II PMs, whose lives are most similar to ours. And we're looking for things that were consistent in their journeys, some patterns. And we did find some. They were most likely to be raised in capital cities, to graduate high school. And actually, a lot of them went on to study law at one of Australia's top eight universities. So taking all those key events into account, we calculated the chances of someone becoming prime minister if they were indigenous as 345 times less likely than if that person had been a non-Indigenous Australian. Wow. So for an Indigenous child born today, their chances of becoming Prime Minister are about six in one million. Throughout this journey, I feel like I've been meeting almost two kinds of people, the optimists and the cynics. And when I see that, I can understand the cynicism. It's about 0.001% uh, from the, the pathways that we looked at. But you know, there's other ways of becoming Prime Minister. We just looked at one model with really the most common pathways. But I feel like some of the people you've met have pioneered their own path in life. They've taken their own journey. And I think our first Prime Minister, who's Indigenous, will be someone who does that too and, and breaks the mould. Yeah. Yeah, no, I, I look at these numbers and I think 
We absolutely have somebody in our community who is capable of doing this. And when I see these numbers, I'm like, it's, it's only going to make them even more amazing. Yeah, yeah. I knew the journey of an Indigenous PM would be hard, but I didn't think it'd be almost unachievable. But I think Yin is right. That person who makes history, who brings Indigenous and non-Indigenous Australia together will be special. And they'll make a new path, one we haven't seen before. To finish my journey, I'm returning to my hometown, Broome. I'm keen to share everything I've learned with the kids I met earlier. Hey, what now? How you gone? It's good. It's good to see you again. It's been a while. I'm apprehensive about revealing the in statistics, but it's important that they know. What do you think the chances are for an indigenous person born today to become prime minister? What do we think, out of 100? Yes. 39%. 39%? What do you reckon? Uh, yeah, about like 40. 40% chance? Yeah? Yeah, 50. 50? All right, I'll show you. Zero. Point zero, zero, one percent. Zero point zero zero one percent. That's how much chance an Indigenous person today has of becoming Prime Minister. What do you think about that? That's not bad. That's really bad. Terribly bad. bad. You think that sounds fair? No. no. How does that make you feel? Um, that was pretty frustrating. I feel mad. It makes me mad again because the fact that the people don't have greater opportunities than what I just think is weird. Do you think if you see a number that low, you should give up? No. 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 Why not? Just give it a try again. That's good. We need that. Resilience, determination. Well, the good news is that on this journey, I met a lot of amazing people. Would you like to see some of them? Yes. 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 Ah. Say things we went on Google, but we're not using it. We went on like a bet, we screwed first, and she screwed. No, we didn't. I was like, it made me see how big, like, the rest of the world is. I want to look at environmental law and energy law. You make change there. But that's what the first Prime Minister who is Aboriginal will represent. That person will speak to all of us. I was elected the first female Prime Minister of the National Indigenous Youth Parliament. It was just pretty much this kind of wake of just becoming leaders. Oh, man, I've never felt so connected, you know? What do you think? Some cool people in there? Yeah. yeah. Who's your favourite person? That guy that talks about all the, like, the Aboriginals, like, that man. Stan Grant, the yeah. journalist? So what did you like about Stan? Um, like, he spoke really, like, maturely. Yeah, he's pretty cool. Anybody else in the doco? Um... Your sister. Pretty amazing to think that she comes from Broome, eh? Yeah. Now she's in, like, a university where most of our prime ministers have come from, studying law. i like to do that in the future. Oh, good. Um, I quite like the university. I think that looked pretty cool. I think, um, the youth prime minister is very inspiring. She's really, like, a good role model to other Indigenous kids. Why would you not want to give up? Because if Aboriginal people train hard and study, and then they can have the opportunity to prove that they're uh, like good to be a prime minister, and black people should have a say. Definitely. So what do you reckon? Any of you think you might want to be the first ever Indigenous prime minister? Oh, oh, oh! Hands are up. Hands are up. It's good. Thank you for being a part of this journey, and I'll see you next time.
go towards indigenous equality in this country. But I believe our young people now have more chances.